So here I want to talk about document processing, in particular my non-disclosure grid, which is part of my master's thesis. And first, uh, there are a lot of passwords in, in the title, and I want to go through them uh, to, and de decompose the title, basically. So first, we have the, the, the term multimodal. In the case of document processing, this means we have mainly textual features. We have visual features outside of text, like lines or separators or boxes. And also, we have uh, 2D spatial information. So where are the where is the text in the in the 2d layout of the document uh, the term privacy preserving um, it basically means that we want to process data without disclosing information so we don't want to disclose personal information in particular uh, and for example according to the article 4 of the gdpr uh, this means that it's data related to identified or identifiable uh, natural person. <clears throat> in our case, we do not want to publish sensitive data. So in, for document processing, this often means for companies, they, they are limited to share their data with third party providers, which are, for example, experts in document processing, or they cannot share their data with research. And uh, or some companies, they need to delete data of their customers, especially documents which contain sensitive information. Uh, and document representation is basically just a numeric form of the document page, which then is useful for downstream tasks, for example, deep learning models in our case. And automated document processing is umbrella term uh, and currently a very important <coughs> and pivotal element towards successful digitization for, for a lot of businesses, for example, in, in banking or medicine. And the, the common tasks there in document processing are, of course, of course, OCR, where we try to, as a first step, extract the text of document images. And then uh, usually we, we need some document classification. And, and uh, a more difficult uh, task is the key information extraction, uh, which has a subtask of form understanding, which is also like key information extraction, but for form documents. So an alternative title without a lot of fancy buzzwords in it could be like, we are basically on the hunt for non-sensitive features, which we can still use uh, in, in document process. And for this, we need a, a reference task. And we choose the key information extraction as a reference to showcase the capabilities of this representation. And in key information extraction, we try to extract relevant information from semi-structured or even unstructured document. Um, and in our case, we can think about it like which token in the document belongs to which class. So sometimes we're interested in addresses, or invoice total amounts, or e IBAN numbers in banking documents, for example. And we also need a reference model. So uh, one, one way of, for key information extraction would be to choose the chart -read net model architecture. Uh, it's a, a model from SAP, and it's a fully convol convolutional neural network. It's a, a encoder decoder architecture very similar to the UNET uh, model and in the original uh, model we have two decoders first is semantic segmentation which is basically a pixel level classification so for each pixel uh, the model classifies to wh which class it belongs and uh, the other uh, decoder is a bounding box regression which is basically made to group things together, for example, line items in invoices. But for this project, we don't use the bounding box regression head, only the semantic segmentation. And on the bottom, you see uh, an example of a segmentation mask. So this is basically the output of the, of the model. In this case, the ground true, like for example, where is the receiver address, where is the sender address, invoice number or total amount, for example, in an invoice document. And we see that it's pretty unbalanced, Im imbalanced. So we have a lot of background 
pixels, like the black pixels here in this case, and the colored pixels are the relevant ones. So when we, we just uh, used the cross entropy loss to train this model, this would, wouldn't work quite well because the model tends to just uh, predict background. So we need uh, to counter this. In this case, we use a static, static aggressive class weighting. So we weight the, the relevant pixels more than the background uh, in the loss, and this, this uh, seems to work quite well. Uh, the reference data sets, I quickly go through them. There are a lot of, a lot, a lot of uh, good data sets in the field of document processing which are publicly available. And uh, these are the, the three I used as a reference. Uh, FUN SD and XFUND are form, form data sets which have header, question, and answer fields. Uh, a special thing about the XFUND data set, it's multilingual. It contains uh, seven uh, languages, but we only use five of them. And the RVLCDIP layout data set is a subset of the Tabacode data set, which only contains invoices in English. And they have like receiver, supplier, invoice <coughs> information, like for example, the invoice number and the total amount of the invoice. <coughs> and now we need to compare our novel approach to existing uh, representations. So for this, we first choose the, basically the image as an input of the model. So just the, the three channel RGB image of the document scan, which is basically a, three, a rank three tensor. Another approach is to try to incorporate text and uh, layout information, which uh, can be done with the char grid. Uh, it's the same paper, like the ChartGridNet paper. They they um, published the ChartGridNet net architecture and the ChartGrid representation, which is made especially for this uh, architecture. And if they try to incorporate text in, with character level encoding. In our case, we chose uh, 56 different characters. These are letters, numbers, special characters, and and uh, every. Every character in this list has a, a number attached to it, and for example, at every position where we have um, letters, we assign it to the according to the corresponding number, and then we one hop encode this representation, and we end up with a grid, which is basically the width and height of the chosen grid size, and uh, in the third dimension we have the, the one hop encoded character representation at every position where this character is. So on the right side, we see uh, how this, this could look for the letters I, N, and V. We have the numbers 9, 14, and 22, and these are encoded like, like this. Again, a rank 3 tensor, same as uh, the <coughs> image representation. Uh, the next step. Uh, the, some, some of the same guys already involved in the char grid did, did this, and um, it's called the BERT grid. And instead of a character level encoding, they did a word piece level embedding. Instead of this one hop encoded character encoding, they use word embeddings. Uh, in this case, we the order of the tokens in the document matter because BERT uh, is contextualized uh, word embedding. So we first need to order all the tokens from left to right, top to bottom, for example. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult because in, in these unstructured documents like invoices or something, it's, it's very difficult to really find the correct order. Because there's not, not, not really like in a, in a newspaper where you know uh, what is the order of the text. And um, for this, we use the pre-trained BERT models uh, without fine tuning. For example, the bird based uncased uh, version on hugging face, and for the X font data set, we use the multilingual uh, version of it. Again, we have a rank three tensor with the height, the width, and uh, in this case, the embedding dimensionality. In our case, for the bird embeddings, it's 768. 
Now let's talk about our non-sensitive components we try uh, to build the non-disclosure grid with. So the first uh, step and, uh, is, is basically the, we call it the layout only mask. And it's just a binary mask with, with ones and zeros where uh, if there's a one on the grid, we know there's, there's some, some text. And if there is uh, a zero, we know there's no text there. And we get this information from uh, an OCR engine, so which not only extracts text, but usually also gives us bounding box information of single tokens or words usually. Uh, and in our case, we, we use this bounding box information and create this, this text mask. And uh, we see here, it basically, it basically contains no sensitive information. So we only have the information if there's text or if there isn't text. Another approach is a very easy textual uh, encoding, very simplified text encoding with only three uh, binary components. So the first component gives, uh, gives us information if there is are letters in alphabetic uh, characters in, in this single word. The second component gives us information if there are numbers in this, in this word or token. And the third one gives us information if there are any characters outside of uh, alphanumeric values. So like special characters, dots, question marks, and so on. And we, we see here uh, some examples. Here, for example, the word square would end up with one zero zero because we have uh, alphabetic characters, but no, no numeric values and no special characters. And for example, the 15.00 would end up with uh, 011 because we have no alphabetic character, but numbers and special characters. For example, here the dot. And the idea behind this encoding is that the, the map model could profit from this information because usually if we want to extract, uh, for example, monetary values in invoices, they have an underlying structure given which is consistent usually over, over the whole data set. So uh, this, this encoding could really help the, the model to, to have the information of what underlying structure the text has without disclosing the, the real text behind it. Because the, the model is not really interested if the, if the total amount of, of the invoice is 15 or, or 70, it doesn't really matter. It's just interested if there is our numbers there. And again, we have not disclosed any sensitive information with this encoding. Another way uh, we tried to incorporate text uh, was with locality sensitive hashing. So there's a very old algorithm usually used for uh, to speed up search el search and um, and we, we apply it to BERT embeddings. So a BERT embedding with 768 components, uh, these vectors we try to <laughs> hash. And we hash them into a n-channel binary mask where n we can choose. So the idea behind uh, the locality sensitive hashing algorithm we use is based on hyperplanes. So we first randomly sample n hyperplanes. And with the help of the dot product, we can uh, say for each <coughs> point in this embedding space, we can say if it's on the right or on the left side of this randomly sampled hyperplane. This gives us, again, a, a one or a zero. Yeah, for example, on the left would be one, on the right would be zero. But yeah, it, it doesn't really matter what you choose, but it has to be consistent. And when we have, for example, here, uh, we have two randomly sampled hyperplanes in this, in this in this case, two-dimensional space, and uh, red would be our embedding vector. And for the blue blue hyperplane, we would end up with a one, and with the green hyperplane, we would end up with a zero, and this would give us our hash one zero. So only two components now. Yeah, and so we can scale this up uh, for bird embeddings in the full bird embedding space. We randomly, randomly sample, uh, let's say, 10 or 100 hyperplanes, and then we end up with 10 or 100 dimensional binary vector. 
Um, for, for humans, usually uh, lines are uh, an important part of, of documents for the, to increase readability. And uh, we try to incorporate lines because, for example, the char grid representation or the bird grid representation does not contain any visual information outside of text, only the, the things which are text. And uh, with the help of a line segment detector, um, it's basic algorithm from computer vision, um, we, we search lines and then incorporate all the found lines inside of a, again, a binary uh, line mask. And here we, we have to be careful to not incorporate text. So we, what we did is we only incorporate lines which are at least 10% of the document width. So because short lines could potentially leak text inside uh, of, of this line mask. Yeah, now we combine all of these components and try to compare it to, to the other representations. And for this, we need a metric. Um, we use the word accuracy rate, which is basically similar to the word error rate. Um, but the, the positive version of it. And we sum up all the correction steps, so the insertions, deletions, and substitutions needed in order to get to the ground true, and divided by the relevant tokens in, in, in the pooled uh, test data set. And the intuition for this, for the word accuracy rate, is somewhat like what percentage of manual labor we can, we can save, we can reduce. And this is our final uh, non-disclosure grid uh, representation compared to the other ones. We incorporate the layout only mask, the alphanumeric categorization, this easy text encoding, and uh, the locality sensitive hashing with 100 random hyperplanes. So we end up with 100 binary channels and the line mask, which is only one channel. And results here, uh, compared to image, char grid, and bird grid, we see that for some data sets, for example, the fun SD data set, we even can, uh, we can even, even have better results than the bird grid representation, <coughs> which has the original text uh, used. And for the x fun data set, we have very similar results. Uh, and for the RVLC DRP layout data set, we cannot uh, match the results of the bird grid. Or, but uh, yeah, easily better than, than the char grid representation. And yeah, numerically speaking, we see here uh, when we split it up in the different uh, classes. So for example, for the form data sets, we have header, question, and answer. We see that for some, some things, like for example, the answer, we, can, we, we are uh, significantly better than the bird grid in case of the far nasty data set, for example. Yeah, and again, we did some, some ablation study where we tried to find uh, which component has more, the most impact. And what we see here, the, the red line, tells us where the bird grid baseline performance uh, is. And in case of the far nasty data set, Already with, with only the layout layout mask, the alphanumeric uh, encoding, the simple encoding, and the line mask, we can already match the performance of the bird grid and don't even need the uh, locality sensitive hashes. But for other data sets, for example, the X fund, we need the locality sensitive hashes in order to, to increase the, the model performance to match or even be better than the the bird, bird grid. Yeah, so as a conclusion, it's a heavily simplified document representation. And it's also, uh, you can think about it as a generalization of documents. So we generalize it uh, with easy, easy and simple encodings. And the results really has, have a lot of implications and indications. So for example, in, ca in, order, in case of the fun SD data set, it seems to be that our representation even helps the model by having uh, 
simpler encodings, the model tends to generalize better on unseen data and has less risk of overfitting. When you think about the, the BERT embeddings and, and only the, the training data set of only 150 documents, for example, yeah, it cannot really train anything on, on these BERT embeddings because uh, it's, it's, it's not enough data. And in our case, with our simplified encodings, uh, I think we, we can help the generalization, for, especially for smaller, smaller data sets. And, and also the implication that the original text of the document oftentimes doesn't really matter or has only limited relevancy. And this is just the beginning of, uh, of a, a search for uh, some non-sensitive features and uh, there is still room for more information inducing components we can look into. So another question would be like the question if the locality sensitive hashing, for example, is really privacy preserving. Could it happen that uh, it leaks some, some textual information? So if, if this would be the case, there's al already the idea that we could maybe flip some random components uh, to, to help the, to preserve the privacy and, and the risk, reduce the risk that uh, it could be a, yeah, a single, single token uh, represented in the hash. And uh, another approach would be to use named entity recognition uh, as, as a future extractor. Uh, I already did some experiments with this without, uh, yeah, with, without very good results because the problem for named entity recognition models they need context, and usually context in, in, in this case would be a sentence. And we don't really have uh, sentences in these documents. So for example, if we want to know if this is a name or an, uh, a location, we only have uh, an, an address block and the context of these address blocks, so the, the close, close tokens of the address are not really relevant uh, for the address block. So, so this is really difficult to have a good named entity rec recognition for unstructured documents. And another way is are basically easy computer vision based uh, feature detections. Um, uh, and also I'm glad that for my master's thesis, I can apply all of these uh, experiments also on a real world data set with over 6,000 uh, invoices uh, for, from a, a private, private company. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. This time I'm not going to ask any questions, but maybe from the audience. Please, yes. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the talk. Really interesting, in my opinion. Um, about the privacy preserving part, I was thinking like, I'm not sure if you've looked into like adversarial attacks and these sort of things, because I'd, I'd be really interested if you, based on your document representation, whether you could classify, for example, if there's like a IBAN number in the document or stuff like that. And I mean, I don't know, it could be the case. Machine learning models can do quite like surprising stuff from time to time. So I think that could be an interesting use case for further testing, like how privacy preserving your document representation is in the end. Yeah, another question there is like, you have to basically you leak the length of the tokens right, with the layout mask. So you know how, how, how's the width of, the, of a single token. And when you think about some combinations of very short last names, and very long street names in addresses, you could potentially find uh, ident uh, identify a single person when you when you can maybe reduce the, the search space a little. So th this could potentially leak information. Yeah. So it's difficult to really say if it's privacy preserving and yeah. Yeah, I think also the dimensionality of the locality sensitive hashing yeah. was right. I guess it matters a lot. Yes, right. yes. Because also in very high dimensional spaces, it's not so intuitive what happens anymore, especially with bird embeddings. 
So I guess there could be like, even if you flip a couple of numbers, it might not change a lot in the end. Yeah. More questions? Um, about uh, anonymization or preserving the privacy, I mean, if you consider hospital documents, the patient name or the client name has to be like, so how do you differentiate that text? So you told NER is not working well to distinguish in this. So what are you thinking in future? Because it's very important, right, to preserve the identity of the clients or patients. Yeah, so with my approach, I, I really don't have to search for sensitive information. So what, what I do is basically find a representation which which I know that I only incorporate information which is already non-sensitive. So, so I don't really have to, to search for, for sensitive information. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood. Yeah, I, I mean, I was, uh, uh, maybe my understanding was different. Like, so, uh, I mean, when you encode the text, like a strings, like the patient name or the client name is a string. So. How do you distinguish uh, that from the remaining part of the text? Because, like, the I, I do it for all. Ah, okay. So I don't distinguish between sensitive and non-sensitive information or in the original document. Yeah. So I do it for, for all. So I, this is uh, to minimize the risk of, of even leaking information. So another approach would be to find sensitive information and then anonymize it. But this approach has a lot of risks because you have a, a machine learning model which searches for sensitive information, but nobody believes this machine learning model that it finds all the sensitive information. So this could be an approach which is could be uh, easier explainable to a customer, for example. You can tell them that, yeah, you only incorporate non-sensitive information. There's no chance of, of, of sensitive information to leak into the representation. But, but really, I mean, sometimes we just don't know. Yes, right? exactly. For in, in our case, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. And because, I mean, you made a perfect example, right? So say I can encode the document visually, like just perfect. Let's assume there's a model that can do that. I would assume you can find out an address pretty easily. That's basically, what you said, right? So it's hard to say. Yes. Yes. So. This would need a lot more of investigation, and also you could end up without really knowing the answer in this case. Yeah. But, but again, I, I already thought about removing the privacy preserving part of the title because it's also interesting uh, without, without this part because it's a really simplified encodings without uh, the original text, and it still performs quite well. So this uh, implication is, is interesting by it all, uh, uh, yeah, by itself. Yeah. Maybe you can say crazy privacy preserve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least that would hold. Oh, last question. Yes. Okay. So you have this um, numeric categorization in three types. Uh, did yeah. you consider to make it more fine-grained, like using some kind of regular expression uh, categorization? Yeah, the problem with this is it's the regular expression categorization would be really problem-specific. So when you have a company which searches for invoice numbers, which has a, an underlying structure which can be found with the regular expressions, you could incorporate this feature. But this is uh, like a general, a general uh, representation where I don't specifically uh, search for features which are uh, good in some cases. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. We go over to the next.